Are you aware that the Rothschild banking family has controlled the United States from the shadows ever since our founding? It may not be written in the official history books, but why do I need evidence for you to believe me? Their plans were briefly foiled in 1836 when Andrew Jackson destroyed their second bank of the US. But they never gave up, and in 1910, they held a secret meeting on Jekyll Island in Georgia to plot their return. They knew that no patriotic American would ever accept a more elastic currency and a more stable banking system. So they waited in complete secrecy until striking just before Christmas 1913, when they put the Federal Reserve Act before a clueless Woodrow Wilson who signed it and the federal income tax at the same time. In so doing, Wilson sold all Americans into perpetual slavery. When he realized what he had done, Wilson lamented, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. Okay, y'all, Wilson never said that. Most everything we've heard on the internet about the creation of the Federal Reserve is wrong. Let me tell you what really happened. San Francisco is burning. An earthquake struck on April 18, 1906, which hit 7.9 on the Richter scale, causing massive damage. Fires broke out and raged uncontrolled for days. 80% of the city was destroyed and over 3,000 people lost their lives. When the smoke finally cleared, Insurance companies were left on the hook for over $5.2 billion in damages. To meet this urgent need, these companies were forced to withdraw their deposits from New York, weakening the U.S. banking system. Later that year, the Bank of England raised interest rates, draining even more money away from New York. Stock prices began to slide. Months later, Investors panicked and pulled deposits from Knickerbocker Trust Company, causing it to fail. Then, the market completely collapsed. Fearing that depositors might come for them next, most banks refused to loan money to anyone, causing interest rates to soar to an unbelievable 70%. In coming months, the contagion would spread to the rest of the country, and banks everywhere shut down. At this point, only one man could possibly push back against the tide and begin to rebuild the country's banking system. That man, this lender of last resort, was banker J.P. Morgan. Morgan bailed out the banks that he thought were worth saving, and he let the others fail. His immense resources acted as a necessary backstop to the economy, and with his support, conditions began to improve. A banker from Memphis wrote to Morgan, saying, The safety and welfare of the financial structure of the country depends almost entirely upon you. He was correct. And that wasn't the first time Morgan had bailed out the U.S. economy. Throughout the 19th century, the country's financial system was plagued with bank runs, suspensions, and outright panics. And it didn't have to be. This kind of thing didn't happen in other countries. At least not to the same degree. When Andrew Jackson ended the second bank of the U.S. in the 1830s, he unleashed massive inflationary forces, which caused both enormous economic booms and equally large busts. After the Civil War, the national banking system mostly fixed the problem of inflation, but at a cost. It created an inflexible currency that wasn't able to grow along with the economy. That was a major problem 
but just as bad was its underlying structure, which encouraged the pyramiding of bank reserves. Small country banks were instructed to keep their reserves in the city banks, which were thought to be more stable. The city banks, in turn, had to keep their reserves in the even larger banks of New York City, which were thought to be the most responsible of all. Okay, but the New York banks weren't going to keep all that money unused. So they were often tempted to give loans to speculators and other stock traders, and they ended up funneling the country's money supply into the New York Stock Exchange. That greatly inflated stock values. It was a massive bubble in search of a pin, and in 1907, it found that pin with the failure of Knickerbocker Trust. If it wasn't them, it would have been someone else. The bankers knew this would keep happening unless there was fundamental change to the system. But that doesn't necessarily mean they cared. When you're a wealthy American banker who grew up in this system, it's easy to get jaded and complacent about it. But European bankers, on the other hand, could not believe that we allowed this to continue. When Paul Warburg, banker and German immigrant, first came to the U.S., he was shocked by what he saw happening in the day-to-day -day operations of the U.S. banking system. I was not here for three weeks before I was trying to explain to myself the roots of the evil. He proposed the establishment of a central bank. Most of Warburg's banker friends agreed, but they told him there was no way Americans would accept such an institution. The U.S. hadn't had a central bank since the time of Andrew Jackson. Even after all this time, hostility to banking, and most of all central banking, remained strong in the American psyche. It was almost a part of our national identity. Despite all the harm Jackson caused during his presidency, he was still considered a hero among Democrats. And conservative Republicans were often hesitant to back any kind of change to the banking system. The most powerful Republican in the Senate around the turn of the 20th century was arch-conservative Nelson Aldrich. When he was asked by the president of Chase National Bank to support currency reform, he shrugged it off, saying, Our currency is as good as gold. Why not let it alone? This was before the 1907 panic. And as economic storm clouds started to gather, Warburg kept trying to push for change. He published an essay, Defects and Needs of Our Banking System, in the New York Times that year. After the panic, everyone saw how unstable the system really was. They also saw how much we relied, literally on the whim of a single incredibly wealthy person, for our collective prosperity. Now, Senator Aldrich was conservative, but he wasn't dumb. He realized the political danger, and he knew he had to do something or Republicans would get creamed in the next election. So he decided to set up a National Monetary Commission to examine the defects in the banking system and to offer a plan to fix them. Aldrich also took a tour of Europe's central banks. It was on this tour in 1910 when he finally became convinced of the need for change. Aldrich was at the tail end of his career by this point, and he began to think that a central bank could be a part of his legacy. It could be his crowning achievement. With the senator now fully on board, the only problem was how to get such a big and controversial idea through Congress. Aldrich may have run the place in his heyday, but political winds had shifted away from big business conservatives like himself and towards a crop of younger progressives. These progressives wanted currency reform. They wanted to reform everything. So it sounds like they'd be natural allies on this. Except, I mean, anything Nelson Aldrich proposed, they probably wouldn't like. And, oh boy, if they knew the idea came from Wall Street, forget about it. Making matters even worse, Aldrich had recently spent some political capital to push through the Payne-Aldrich Tariff of 1909, 
which was massively unpopular. Aldrich was absolutely hated. He was being constantly attacked in the media. If he had announced at that time that he was working on a central bank, it would have died immediately. So in 1910, that's why Aldrich decided to go on a secret meeting with Wall Street bankers to hash out a plan to create a new federal bank. They'd travel separately to a remote location in Georgia, Jekyll Island, telling anyone who asked that they were going on a duck hunting trip. There were six conspirators in total. Harry Davison, a banker with J.P. Morgan, Frank Vanderlip, the president of National City Bank, Piat Andrew, the assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Senator Aldrich, of course, and a senior staffer, and last but not least, Paul Warburg. They didn't agree on all the details, but they knew they wanted to avoid having their new system seen as a central bank. So they called the idea the Reserve Association of the United States and it would be a voluntary association of banks with a democratic structure. Local reserve associations would send representatives to one of 15 regional branches, and much of the power would be held at the regional level. This reserve association would be run by bankers, not by the government, which Aldrich thought was an important point for maintaining its independence. Regarding things like setting interest rates or managing reserve requirements, Aldrich said that these are business questions. They are not political questions. The question of money and banking had been debated in the public sphere for a century in the US. But after the populist uprising we talked about last episode, fiscal conservatives were worried about losing control so they wanted to remove the issue from politics completely. Aldrich also removed himself from politics. He stepped down from the Senate in 1911. But before he did, he released his banking plan to the National Monetary Commission and to the public in January of 1911. Its origins were secret, yes, but the plan was public. The New York Times headline read, Extra, extra! Aldrich money plan avoids central bank. Not entirely true, but it was good press. Having left the Senate, Aldrich now traveled the country giving speeches to build support for his plan, which faced significant skepticism from some bankers and also from regular people. So he continued to deny his plan would create a central bank at all. We do not think it fair that men who admit they have not read the plan should raise the cry of a central bank or summon the ghost of Andrew Jackson. He got 29 state banking associations to sign on to the plan. He also got support from President Taft, which was a big win. But the leader of the Democratic Party, William Jennings Bryan, didn't like it quite as much. The Aldrich plan would lead to absolute commercial and industrial slavery. As the election of 1912 was heating up, Bryan wrote opposition to the Aldrich plan by name into the Democratic platform. We oppose the so-called Aldrich bill or the establishment of a central bank. And the Republican party didn't like it much better. Conservatives like Taft and Aldrich were on the way out, even in the GOP. The Republican convention that year was a total disaster, with delegates getting into literal fistfights. President Taft was pretty unpopular, but he used his control over the party machinery to secure the nomination. Teddy Roosevelt stormed out of the convention hall and started a third party which all but guaranteed a Democratic victory in November. At this point, supporters of banking reform had no choice but to approach Woodrow Wilson, a Princeton professor and rising star of the Democratic Party, who seemed likely to be the next president. Frank Vanderlip approached Wilson privately and asked him what he thought about the idea of a central bank. Wilson thought about it for a moment and then said, Yes, he knew the banking system needed reform, 
but he wasn't willing to say that in public yet. The Aldrich plan is 60 to 70 percent correct. But first, I've got to get elected. Wilson was also being pressured by William Jennings Bryan to oppose the legislation. On the campaign trail, Wilson criticized the Aldrich plan, seeming to side with Bryan. This country will not brook any plan which concentrates control in the hands of bankers. Wilson ultimately won the presidency with Bryan's support. Democrats were now in control of both houses of Congress and the presidency for the first time in decades. That meant the Aldrich plan was a dead letter. It wasn't even considered. But even so, reform was in the air and most people in both parties agreed that some kind of change to the banking system was necessary. More than anyone, William Jennings Bryan and the populists had been pushing for banking reform for decades. Conservatives and Wall Street bankers were slow to see the need for change, but over the past few years, they had mostly all gotten on board. The only question was, who would be in control of the new banking system? The people or the bankers? Before he was sworn in as president, Wilson met with Carter Glass, a representative from Virginia, who would be the new chair of the House Banking Committee in the Democratic administration. Knowing that the Aldrich plan was dead, Wilson asked Glass to work on a new banking reform bill. Glass finished his first draft by the end of January 1913. Since Glass was a conservative who was opposed to any kind of centralized authority, he kept the regional model from the Aldrich plan. But unlike the Aldrich plan, these regional banks would not be bound together at all. Each region, more or less, would have its own central bank. And these banks would still be privately owned and controlled by the bankers. As you might expect, William Jennings Bryan, who had been appointed as Wilson's Secretary of State, hated this idea. He didn't want bankers to have control over the system. He was even going to resign over it. But Wilson knew that without his support, there was no way any banking bill would pass. That's how popular he was. And the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, Robert Owen, was a progressive who agreed with Bryan on this. Wilson kept Bryan from resigning, and he asked the more conservative Glass to work out a compromise. The revised bill would be mostly the same, except it would give the public control over the banking system. He asked that the Federal Reserve Board, which would oversee the system, be composed of seven presidential appointees, not bankers. Bryan also insisted that the new currency, Federal Reserve Notes, be made an obligation of the United States and not of any private bank. That's what Bryan and the populists had wanted all along. Public money created by the government. Even today, if you look closely, you'll notice that our money is signed by the Secretary of the Treasury and by the Treasurer of the United States, not by a Federal Reserve banker. Now you know why. Carter Glass hated the idea of public control. He wanted the new system to have independence from politics. But Wilson soothed him by downplaying the importance of these compromises. I mean, does it matter whose name is on the currency? If we can hold to the substance of the thing and give the other fellow the shadow, why not do it? If thereby we may save our bill. That convinced Glass to go along with it, but the bankers? knew better. With their allies in the media, they went on a major counterattack. Radical! Socialistic! The Federal Reserve Act is covered all over with the slime of Bryanism. Wilson was furious, especially at the American Bankers Association, for their refusal to support a bill they knew was necessary. Will one of you gentlemen tell me in which civilized country of the earth there are important government boards of control on which private interests are represented? Wilson held firm on the issue of public control, 
but he was willing to compromise in other areas to secure the bill's passage. The final bill lowered the number of reserve banks from 15 to 12 and lowered their reserve requirements as well, which pleased the bankers. Each bank's required contribution before they could join the system was also lowered, and the dividends they got for owning Federal Reserve stock were increased. Terms for governors on the reserve board were boosted to 10 years so that no one president could name a full board. By the way, in 1935, terms were increased even further to 14 years. This helps the Federal Reserve Board have some measure of independence. I could go on and on about the details here, but I'm going to gloss over a lot of it for the sake of time. The takeaway is that the Federal Reserve Act was the result of a complex negotiation taking place over years that balanced the interests of multiple groups, including farmers and bankers, progressives and conservatives. No one got everything they wanted, and the final negotiations took much longer than originally anticipated. But President Wilson wouldn't let Congress go home before they finished it. That's how important he thought it was. The U.S. House approved Glass's bill on September 18th by a vote of 285 to 85. But Owen's bill wasn't approved in the Senate until December 19th, and they passed it by a slimmer margin, 54 to 34. Then they held a marathon session on December 21st to reconcile the differences between Glass and Owens' version. They stayed up until 4 a.m. that night, but they finally got it done. The new Federal Reserve Act was then approved by both the House and the Senate again before Wilson could finally sign it into law on December 23rd, 1913. Looking back on those conspiracy theories I mentioned at the beginning, yes, the Jekyll Island trip actually happened, and the final bill was signed right before Christmas. But far from being written in secret, the Federal Reserve Act was debated and modified to its final form in plain view of the public. It wasn't dropped on anyone at the last minute. And Wilson never regretted it. On the contrary, it was an amazing accomplishment that he was proud of. But that doesn't mean that it's above criticism. The Federal Reserve has mostly failed in its responsibilities to help us avoid financial panics, to stop unemployment, and to reduce inflation. Just like the national banking system it replaced, it has flaws. But it was a huge step forward for its time. It did give us a more flexible national currency that is allowed to grow as the economy does. It's also given us more regulation over the banking system. It can help to prevent bank failures by offering needed liquidity. And it's given us a much more efficient system for clearing checks, which is no small thing. Most importantly, we no longer have to rely on the generosity of the richest man in the country to keep our banking system afloat. If you want to learn more about the Federal Reserve's history and about how it functions today, I'm making a short companion video for this episode that I'll link here and in the description when it's ready. Woodrow Wilson deserves a lot of credit for shepherding this thing through, as does Paul Warburg, Nelson Aldrich, and of course, Glass and Owen. But the world they created the system for wouldn't last much longer. They couldn't predict it at the time, but just seven months after the act was signed, the First World War would break out across Europe, permanently crippling the world's currency system. The unworkable idea of the gold standard would be one of the first casualties of war.